Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're joining us on YouTube, thanks for stopping by. We'd appreciate it if you would like, comment, and subscribe to our channel for more videos on all things aphasia. This is Ask the Expert with Sigourney Tansman. He'll be talking with us about her book, Hope After Stroke, and the three things you need to be, do, and have on the journey of recovery after stroke. I'll be your moderator for this hour-long session. My name is Jen. I'm part of the team at the National Aphasia Association. This year, we're celebrating 35 years of support, providing access to research, education, rehabilitation, therapeutic, and advocacy services to individuals with aphasia and their care partners. On today's agenda, we'll be hearing from Sigourney Tansman. Then we'll open the floor to those in our live audience for questions. And now I'm overjoyed to introduce our panelist, Sigourney Tansman. Sigourney has been a speech language pathologist for more than 25 years, a life coach, master practitioner of neurolinguistic programming, speaker, and the author of Hope After Stroke, which I see as an absolute essential resource. Hope After Stroke is an evidence-based resource that looks at the brain, neuroplasticity, practical tools, strategies to use when navigating the hospital setting and re-entering your home life. It gives clarification on medical terms that stroke survivors and caregivers might find helpful. And of course, it looks at hope and optimism. I wish I had this book when I was caring for my own grandmother, but I'm glad I have it now. Sigourney, thank you for being part of our series. Thank you so much, Jen. I am really, really excited to be with everybody. I think the National Aphasia Association has done such a fabulous job, um, not only in elevating awareness about aphasia, but giving so many opportunities for community to connect. This is a very different um, NAA than it was back in the day when I was just a grad student. So uh, there's so many more resources for people now, and I'm thrilled to be here. So I am ready to start and I wanted to talk about, and you know, I truly have to say, I'm preaching to the choir when I say, stroke is an unplanned journey without a map, right? All of you know that. Not one of you set out to have a stroke and then went, okay, that was on my to-do list. So today I wanna to talk to you about the three things you need to make this journey. And I wanna keep it in the context of making any journey. Right? We need fuel to make a journey. We need a vehicle to make a journey. And that vehicle is gonna run out of gas at some point. We need a gas station. So let's talk about what those three things really are. I like to say that the fuel of your journey is your mindset. Now, I don't know about you, but I know when I was a kid growing up, my family every summer would drive from Miami Beach to Dayton, Ohio. And there were three kids and one grandmother and two parents in a Chevy Impala that had no air conditioning or power windows. And we went in the dead of summer in August. And we weren't probably two hours into the trip when all of the kids, my brothers and sister would say, are we there yet? And that is the common refrain I hear from a stroke survivor. When am I going to get there? So with the, we know that the mindset is the most important part of your journey because stroke is not a quick trip. It's a journey. Um, I used to listen to one physiatrist who used to say, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So we have to have the fuel that's going to sustain us throughout the journey. And that is that mindset. One of the things that I really tell people about is begin where you are. Now, I know that's really hard because people don't want to begin where they are. I do even remember talking to the wife of a patient of mine. He was a superior court judge who had a terrible aneurysm that left him with no intelligible speech whatsoever. He couldn't make one one syllable sound like English. He was a Stanford educated professional. He couldn't point to a cup when I showed him three objects. Several months after he'd been hospitalized, he finally had pointed to four different objects when I said what they were. 
And I ran to go tell his wife because I was so excited. And she looked at me and said, oh, hon, we have way different baselines. And she was right. But I was also right. Because we have to start where we are. Now, I'll give you the spoiler alert or the fast forward on this man's story. He worked so hard for two years in all kinds of therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. And then he underwent such extreme neuropsychological testing that I think anybody would have had a hard time passing those tests. He was able to go bench as a superior court judge and practice for 10 more years after his stroke when we just couldn't even imagine he could make that much progress. So we need to talk about the fuel of recovery as your mindset and beginning where you are, no matter where you are, and building on the platform of success of your skills. Find what's working. We're always looking for what's working. You might have a better ability to gesture. You might have a better ability to draw something. You might have a good ability to say a word if you're prompted with a syllable or to sing something. So we're always looking for find what's working and focus on what's working to take the next step. So that's the first part of the journey. You need fuel. The second part of the journey is you need a vehicle. Well, I guess you need fuel to put in that vehicle. So you could figure out which one comes first, but you need a vehicle. I like to say that the vehicle is your daily routines. After stroke, your routines are the hot, are like the, the anchoring activities for you for predictability. Once again, I don't have to tell you if you've had a stroke that neuro fatigue, an unusual level of fatigue is much more common. And it's the kind of fatigue that isn't even necessarily aided by sleep, but it can be. But the reason I'm talking about routines is because a routine conserves mental energy. When you're not having to constantly re-decide everything that's taking place. So you want to create some basic routines and put them into habit. Habits that become automatic don't require the same cognitive capacity that other activities where you're making decisions do. When I work with a patient, I like to have them create a menu of activities. Just like when you go to a restaurant, you know you're hungry, but you may not know what you want to eat. So you look at a menu. And this menu of activities can be divided into sections for mental, physical, spiritual, leisure activities. And I like to say pick one to three of those activities a day, depending on your level of fatigue. But pick one to three of those activities and then incorporate that into your day. It does a lot of things. Number one, it creates interest in your life. You are a human being first and foremost. And I'm speaking to the stroke survivor, but I'm also speaking to the caregivers and the family members. We are all human beings first and foremost. That's why as a life coach, the principles that I talk about in this book apply to everybody. In fact, I've had people tell me, I read your book and I applied it to my situation or, or another illness or just regular life because they're the basic foundations of living a healthy, well-balanced life, mentally and physically healthy. So you want to create these daily routines to stimulate, again, your mental, your physical, your spiritual or leisure sides. So we've talked about the fuel we needed. That's your mindset. Now we've talked about the vehicle of those daily routines, something that you know you can count on, and then something that can change out. I want to say one more thing about routines that I think is really fantastic. And this was not an original idea, but I love that when we meet in community, we learn so many things. I learned this from a stroke survivor 
in England of all places. And he talked about how he chose to think of various activities as green, yellow, or red light activities. Green activities were things that were simple for him, easy cognitive or physical activities. Things that didn't require a lot of energy or drain or, or wouldn't drain him. Those yellow activities took a little bit either more physical ac you know, action or cognitive action. And then there were the red activities, the ones that really required a lot of thought that would wear him out. And maybe that was, you know, talking to an insurance agent. I can tell you personally, when I talk to somebody from the insurance company, I know I need to plan time around that because it takes a long time. I may not understand everything and it's frustrating. Add that to your situation where maybe language is a problem or maybe you're stressed about the bill you just received. And so you're on this stress you know, you're operating out of a stress response anyway. So that's kind of a red level activity. So as you plan your day, try and choose some things that are a mixture. Don't ever try and put two red activities next to each other that don't have space in between. A period of time to rest. And believe it or not, even getting in the car as a passenger or having people visit where you're maybe not going to respond so much, takes a lot of energy. If you're in the hospital, visitor after visitor, you know, I'm, I'm talking to caregivers here, but I want you to know that if your loved one is in the hospital, we think that it's great that people come to visit, and it may be, but you have to understand how energy depleting it actually can be. So let's talk about the third thing, the gas station. The gas station is what we need to refuel ourselves. One of the greatest places that I've seen is the rehab part of the hospital in the gym. People are trying new things. They're learning new ways to walk. They're stretching themselves in really challenging ways. But there is a spirit of optimism and hope and real thrill and enthusiasm for one another. It's the place of a lot of tears. I know some of you have been to physical therapy and they, we call it PT. And those physical therapists are known for PT, meaning pain and torture. It is not easy to get your body to cooperate in a new way. But in that gym too, there's still this incredible optimism and energy that we all share for each other you're going to need to refuel yourself through resources. If you're at home, the National Aphasia Association has these fantastic resources through their aphasia cafes and their various programs. Find support groups, community groups. You're going to want to, in this new age of a pandemic, even new ways to connect, right? I think so many people that I've met in the stroke community have been saying, now all of you know how isolated I have felt. You've expanded our ability to connect with people. I know so many of the support groups now have drawn people from all over the country and sometimes even the world because of this fantastic accessibility through Zoom. So what I wanna to say to you in the end is that recovery from stroke is 100% to finally encourage you to check your thoughts and your mindset when you're asking yourself, are we there yet? And notice each and every day where you really are, where you have come from and where you're going. Find hope. You know, I like to say that hope is the fuel of recovery and action is the vehicle. I want to end with one little story. It was about a patient that I accompanied. I accompanied the wife, the caregiver, and the actual patient. This was a fairly young, young 40. Rendered him blind. And um, 
without any ability to speak. In fact, at the beginning, he was mute. He didn't seem to understand anything either. He was very much in his own world. And I accompanied them to their first doctor visit after the stroke, after he'd been home. And the wife said to the doctor, you know, what do you think, doctor? I mean, do we have any hope? Is he going to recover? And the doctor said, I don't want to give you any false hope. You know, he's had a devastating injury. I don't want to give you false hope. And I didn't say anything then. But when we left the doctor's office, I said to the woman, there's no such thing as false hope. Hope is hope, right? Doctors have a diagnosis. We see where that patient is in this moment of time, but they don't know what that prognosis is. I've seen patients who look like they would never recover, like the man that I first spoke to you about, that went back to his career. Not everybody recovers in that way, but it is astounding to see, and I have learned this from my patients, what a meaningful life a person can have. It may not look like, even though my book is titled Hope After Stroke for Caregivers and Survivors, The Holistic Guide to Getting Your Life Back, the spoiler alert about that is we never get our lives back, we only get our lives forward. None of us goes back in time, but the stories that I've heard and witnessed myself of people creating meaningful, purposeful, amazing lives is a possibility. And that's what I want you to remember and take away with, hope. Hope for your recovery and for anybody you know who is going through stroke recovery. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I think what I want to share about the book that I wrote, too, is that, and, and I'll just share it for a second here, but um, let's see, is it, <laughs> I never know how to do this. This book is divided into three sections. The three sections are what happened, life in the hospital. So if you're joining this call and you're fairly new to the world of stroke recovery, maybe you have a loved one in the hospital right now or a friend. There's a lot of information about being in the hospital and why it's critical to start becoming an active participant in your caregiver team. You get a quick crash course in all the medical terminology in a very simplistic way because you are literally having so much information come at you at one time. I wrote the book because I wanted you to be empowered and feel smart and be able to ask questions of your care team. And then the second part of the book is what's next. So once you leave the hospital, you're at home. And while that's everybody's dream to leave the hospital, right? Everybody's like, I can't wait till I get home. And then they get home, and they're like, oh, oh my God, I don't know what to do when I'm home, right? So there's lots of information about how to transition to homecoming and a lot of practical, simple tools and strategies. And then the next part is about what now? Because there will come a time, in most people's insurance at least, that therapists all leave, your insurance coverage is good, and now you have to make life your therapy. So this book really takes you through all those three areas um, in very, very simple but very practical ways. And it's, there's so many stories of patients that I've worked with who have taught me so much. So I just wanted to share that with you, and I'm happy to uh, hear any questions, and hopefully I can answer those. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for sharing such inspirational words. I, I also want to mention that I think uh, your book is obviously very wonderful for persons with aphasia and their care partners, but I think it's also a very comprehensive book for student clinicians to approach aphasia and stroke holistically. So I personally really love your book and really appreciate it. 
Um, so very quickly, as a reminder to our live audience, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A chat. So again, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a button that says Q&A. Um, if you just enter your questions there, I'll be able to see them a little bit uh, more easily. So I'm going to start us off and ask how and why did you choose the imagery on your cover? I love that question. Um, this book is self-published, and so I was able to find various people to help me throughout the world, really. My editor was from the United States, but I had a book designer that was in Pakistan and an illustrator that was in Sri Lanka and my formatter in Macedonia. And the book cover was so... I started with a concept. I thought, well, the word hope has got an O in it, and I'd like maybe a life preserver, right? And I was thinking about maybe a person sort of flying through the air, grabbing onto this life preserver. Well, when I submitted this brief idea, my various book, uh, many, many, but they all looked like somebody had drowned. There were images of people drowning in the water, and I went, oh, this is not what I'm looking for when I say hope. <laughs> so we then went back to the drawing board, and I started to say, well, maybe it's about, you know, the brain grows new pathways. And one of the designers presented an image of a tree, and then we started to get the ball rolling. I went, yes, and then I got to this image this tree with multi colors. And I thought this is the perfect image because there's, there are seasons to recovery. And, and I felt like the leaves on the trees looked like various different seasons. And some were growing and some were in the process of already blooming and some were in early stages. And to me that symbolized real growth. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. We have a question uh, from our live audience. So in your wonderful book, you talk about a friend of yours with aphasia who is motivated through surfing. Um, today, an audience member says, I know that running, walking, and biking are very helpful for people with aphasia. What more should we do? Pursue anything and everything that has your curiosity. My, um, the patient that I worked with who was a surfer had actually surfed the day of his stroke. That wasn't what caused his stroke. He surfed the day of his stroke on New Year's Day. He went to help his mother move a very heavy piece of surgery, uh, surgery, a heavy piece of furniture, and he had a dissected uh, carotid artery that caused his stroke. The surfing group that we do. The name is escaping me at the moment, but it's in the book. I found out about this program. We looked at videos. I showed it to him. Now, he was paralyzed on one side of his body, but he was so, and the day that we actually started looking into this was a day of therapy where he was just beyond frustrated. And he didn't really get frustrated, but he was overwhelmed and tired. And we ended up finding this video online. And all of a sudden, he oh, was so still, go so ahead. Wanna, I'm sorry, I think your microphone is cutting out. Oh, okay, let's try this. Hopefully that's better. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this gentleman still had a helmet because he had had a craniotomy and they hadn't put the, the flap on his skull yet. And he was thinking about going surfing, but it's like, oh, but wait, <laughs> I need to get the rest of my head on before we could do this. But he was so motivated by that. And uh, we did go to this adaptive program. It was one of the most thrilling, exciting things. So whatever your interests are in, there are typically adapted programs if you have physical limitations. Whatever you're interested in, try it. Take a couple of classes, pursue it. Just follow your curiosity. Thank you. Uh, so we also have a question about semantic variant PPA. Um, this audience member would like to know if you have any research results that you found helpful for people like me. I am sorry that I 
don't. I actually do not have information about that. I'm not familiar with that. There's, I, I'm glad to hear that you are dealing with somebody that specializes in that, but that is not an area of expertise, so I'm sorry. I will say this about the field of speech pathology. It is vast. I think at some point soon, they will probably, they will probably narrow the specialty down. Just so many areas from voice and fluency, aphasia, um, um, you know, receptive language, expressive language, autism, brain injury. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Thank you so much. Actually, so for our audience, we will be having an Ask the Expert on February 10th, and that is going to be specifically on PPA. So please feel free to send in all of your questions about PPA for our February 10th Ask the Expert. Thank you so much. So how can I help my spouse who has aphasia give the correct time? This is an interesting question. So I guess my question really is, what do you mean by give the correct time? Is that the person is trying to look at their watch and they don't say the words right, or they want to tell you that they're going somewhere, but they can't tell you the correct time. So I'm not sure what that actually means, but some, uh, some, some choices is could the person write it down? Um, could they use their fingers to show you numbers? Would that help? We have to try as many different um, approaches as we possibly can. So I, I hope that maybe got to the answer a little bit. Yes, I also wanna mention that we are getting some questions about closed captioning for today's live session. Unfortunately, the closed captioning option isn't working for us today, but this is a recorded session and the YouTube version will have accurate transcriptions. So if you are having difficulty finding that YouTube video, you can always email me. My email address is jenataphasia.org and I'm gonna put that in the chat. Okay. On to our next question for Ms. Sogoina Tansman. How can I make long-term plans when I don't know how my recovery will develop? Oh, I love that. I say that you make long-term plans based on what you want your recovery to be. I just made a trip plan to go to Florida. It didn't happen. But in the process of making that plan, I learned about where I was going to go where I was going to stay, I found a car, I found I planned the entire thing so that I know that I can do it, It'll maybe not in the timeline that I expected it to be. So I would take looking at what are your goals? What are the outcomes that you want? And then start to work your way back to that. Asking a couple of questions like, who do I have to be in the process of becoming that? What do I have to believe? And what am I willing to do in order to get there? Thank you. So a very common question that we get is how can I make, oh, sorry. When will I get over this? How long, it, how long does it take to get your speech back? Yeah, that's that are we there yet question. And I, and I totally understand. It's the best question to ask. And quite honestly, the question that I would ask. And as I say in my book a lot, you'll hear a frustrating answer, which is we don't 100% know. Every brain is different. Every recovery is different. I've seen people who've had what we would consider a worse prognosis, a worse diagnosis, have a better improvement versus somebody who has mild impairment and not as great an improvement. And I talk in the book about the secret sauce of recovery. This is not true for everybody and I recognize that aphasia is really quite different. I understand how absolutely frustrating it must be to hear that we don't know. It's not as if we can give you a magic pill. <laughs> it's not like a bone that breaks that we know recovers in six weeks, right? Um, what I had started to say was, <laughs> I actually lost my train of thought, but the, what the point about aphasia is it's, it's a bit different than other aspects of recovery. 
And a lot has to do with, you know, how do we manage it on a day-to-day -day basis? Here's some things I know that make it worse. So sometimes if we can manage what makes it worse, we can have improvement. Some of the things that make it worse are stress, right? When we're under pressure, it is way harder to come to have speech, right? Even before you had a stroke, you know that if your boss asked you a question and you were feeling stressed, it was hard to come up with an answer, right? I know I'm talking in front of a bunch of people. I lost my train of thought. That's a stress response, right? And then I couldn't think of what I wanted to say. So we know stress and managing stress, that becomes one of those vehicle daily routines. Getting out ahead of your day, I do a mindfulness and meditation practice. Some people pray, some people read Bible verses. Whatever you can do to lower your stress about your own mental process, I recommend, that's one thing. Sleep, so important. We can't underestimate the value of sleep for regenerating our best ability to speak. Hydration, making sure you're hydrated. Only 2% of dehydration can cause a tremendous mental incapacity to communicate. So if you can manage those three basic things, stress, sleep, and hydration, you'll be further ahead. And then focus on what you are doing. Take inventory of what worked well today. Whatever we focus on, we get more of. If our direction and focus is on, I can't say anything, this sucks, I'll never be able to speak, we tend to create more stress around that. When we start to notice the things that we were able to do, look for progress, not perfection and use every available resource, whether it's gesturing, writing, singing, speaking, pointing, use whatever you can. Someone in our audience asks, Sigourney, please talk about meditation. Mm. Um, there's some wonderful meditation, there's lots and lots of different kinds of meditation. Um, from simple mindfulness, where you literally just sit down and just focus on your breathing, you know, breath in, breath out. Now, everybody, everybody, including me, says, but my mind's too busy. I have so many thoughts when I'm meditating. Well, that's because you have a brain. <laughs> that's a good thing, right? And so it is a practice. It's called a meditation practice where you just commit to sitting down. I have done guided meditations that might work best for you in the very beginning to have somebody talking you through it. There are tons of free apps out there on YouTube and apps. Um, there are, uh, right now, one of the things that I listen to, it's an app with, it's got sounds and I listen to the sound of rain. And then as my mind gets busy, I say, thinking. I don't judge my thought. I don't go, God, you just can't stop thinking. I just label that as thinking. I try and have a visual image of like either cars passing on the freeway, you know, in a blur, like one after the other. My thoughts keep going one after the other. Balloons or clouds, you know, whatever is sort of boring enough to not get your attention. Like if you're a car person, you might go, oh, wow, that's a really, that's a beautiful Lamborghini. And then all of a sudden you're down in the woods. So Give yourself a minute to practice, but it's the consistency of doing it. And I will tell you this, I promise you, if you are turning on your news as the first thing that you do in the morning, you are setting yourself up for increased stress. There is a world out there of stuff you cannot control. And the news that is on the news is everything that is pretty horrible. They might throw you a bone at the very end and tell you something that's positive and uplifting. But by that point, you're, you know, practically on the table in tears. Please start your day by choosing the thoughts you want to choose. Taking a breath outside, looking up at the sky. That physical activity of just looking up. I had a patient tell me that today. 
she said, one of the things that I like to say to people is just look up. And that's true because just look up is the complete opposite of what the body does in depression. Just look up, look at the sky, start your day by choosing the thoughts you're going to think. Give yourself time to practice and steadily increase over a period of time. What motivated you to create a book? I love that. Well, that came from a meditation, quite honestly. So um, both of my parents died pretty young. My mother was 64 and my dad was 68. And I was approaching my 64th birthday. I'm 66 now. And um, so I was 63 and I was thinking, what am I going to do to leave something to the world? And that was my meditation. That was my question that I had. What was my meditation? And, <laughs> and I heard, write a book. Now, I have written things before. I've got 16 stories published in various Chicken Soup for the Souls, but I had never written a book. And, and I heard, write a book about stroke. And, <laughs> and then I remember arguing by saying, OK, but if I write a book about stroke, I'm, it's going to be the book I want to write, and it's going to be what I feel is the truth, right? It may not be the stuff that is even accepted right now. I'm going to dare to say the word holistic. You see, because when I started in speech pathology, when I was working with patients, I've always come from a background of visualization and meditation and, and sort of this, you know, holistic approach, right? I mean, typically what happens in the hospital is we vivisect a person. Speech therapists work from the neck up, occupational therapists work from the neck to the trunk, and physical therapists work from the trunk down. But I always saw that person as a whole person, and I think the teams really do see that. But we couldn't really say those things when we were writing notes. And so to answer the question about why did I write this book, it's like I want to write it because I want people to feel smart and empowered. I want them to know what, what life is, that life is meaningful, that they can get a life that's meaningful for them. I mean, I have a chapter in here about sex because in all the time that I worked, and listen, I know the difference between, you know, what is my lane and maybe let the social worker, but nobody ever talked to those patients about sex. Nobody gave them the opportunity to say, if you want to talk about it, here's some questions you might want to ask. Nobody gave them the permission. It's like all of a sudden that part of their life didn't exist. I don't think so. Especially the young, you know, so many younger people are having sex, I'm mean, having sex, <laughs> are having strokes. They're having sex too. We're all having sex, right? Um, so I wanted to, you know, to just like be able to look at a holistic person, to make somebody feel smart when they were asking questions of their care team to take control of their journey. Thank you so much for sharing. Our next question comes from our live audience. What are some therapeutic approaches or inquiries to help people express feelings and emotions if and especially they are experiencing spoken language in a new way after stroke? Yeah. Um, I think the social workers are fantastic at working with people um, who are having difficulty with verbal language. And, you know, a, a lot of times they'll have visual presentations of faces or, you know, sort of um, numeric scales of how somebody feels. Um, and I think that that's really important. And then we can nuance what that feeling is. I have found there are stroke social workers that are familiar more with the population of aphasia and being able to ask questions and make inquiries about feelings. That social worker might also work closely with the speech therapist to help in that. But I think it's very important uh, for people with aphasia to be able to share their feelings and express themselves. Thank you so much. Um, what advice do you have for persons with aphasia who want to go back to work? Um, I think that's a fantastic thing. It depends on what your work situation is. Working with the speech therapist and 
the um, the environment, the career environment that you're working in, if you're trying to go back to your previous job. So for example, I worked with a, a man. Um, in all honesty, he did not have aphasia, but he did have some significant uh, communication difficulties around his vocal volume um, and some word finding. He did have a milder form of aphasia, uh, but he could carry on a conversation. But we worked a lot with his employer to modify the situation um, to help him with his phone calls, because phone calls were definitely more difficult than in-person communication. Um, it depends on what the job is and whether or not you need to use a lot of verbal language. I know people, I think it was even on one of your aphasia expert um, panels that talked about a man who took a different class and became a drafter, right? So you know, your work life does not have to be over, it can be pivoted. And that's where we wanna build on that, those skills of um, those platforms and skills of things you can currently do. And working with a vocational rehab specialist can also be very helpful. In your book, you share a story about a person named Scott who was all about showing gratitude and finding humor in his recovery. What advice do you have for someone who isn't yet in that mind frame? Right. Um, and his mind frame really came from day one. It was extraordinary to see. He had such a severe stroke and he was a young man, the father of three young girls. Um, and I think his faith, and this is one of the other things that I see is the secret sauce of recovery is faith. And it doesn't mean faith in any particular thing. It could be Buddha, Allah, God, Jesus, you know, um, a rock. It could be atheists found, you know, faith in their doctors. Finding something that's bigger than you. Um, some people found just their family wanting to progress for their family or just looking at those small things. Noticing the acts of kindness that people have just start to notice them. Somebody brings you a cup of coffee. Somebody holds the door open. Somebody smiles. We minimize those things, but those are actually the things that, you know, when I talk about the, the gas station, the power-ups, that's a power-up that you're gonna need to kind of look at, like, look at the things that do create gratitude, find them. Find your own gratitude when you focus, what you focus on, you build more of. And the more you build a gratitude list, like in this caregiver um, workbook that I had created, that's one of the practices um, under spirit. It's like, what do I or can I appreciate today? And if we can focus on three things, it could be just a, you know, that I had a cup of coffee, that I made it to the bathroom. Let's be serious, right? <laughs> right? Um, all of those could be a means of finding gratitude. Thank you. Um, in your book, you also talk about an aphasia ID card, but one of our participants has commonly been ignored when he's used his aphasia ID card. What advice can you give in that type of situation, especially if it's uh, in a more sensitive situation like with police officer? Yeah. Um, and I, I'm glad they brought that up because I do encourage patients um, or people to carry cards because I want them to understand what's happening. If you're in a car and you feel comfortable enough to post that aphasia card on the dashboard, so if you were to be stopped, that you could point to that because trying to reach into your wallet could be misunderstood by a police officer. They like your hand on the wheel. So pointing to the dashboard as a place for them to look might be helpful. I'm not sure if being ignored when they go to um, like a store and they try and present it. A lot of times what happens is that somebody on the other end thinks you're trying to sell them something, right? You might gesture to your mouth and say, <laughs> right, that is a, an option too. 
Um, I've had people sometimes could text, but they couldn't speak and they've put it in their phone as a text and they show them their phone. So that's another option. Thank you. I also want to mention that the National Aphasia Association has our own uh, aphasia ID card that you can print and fill out uh, your information ahead of time. But we will also soon be having our own merchandise, one of which is a sticker that you can stick on your dashboard or on your uh, car window. The other thing I want to say about that too, you know, at least police officers are used to seeing medic alert bra bracelets. And that might be something that you could do as well. And people commonly do see those. And if you're pointing to a bracelet, if that's something that you want to do and point to a bracelet that they could take a look at it. Great advice. Um, along the same lines, when speaking over the phone, what advice can you give to communicating to a customer service representative, especially when relaying a longer number? Um, so it can work both ways when you have to give a number or when you have to receive a number and practicing the word slow, please. Slow, please. Over. I know that sometimes just finding any words are difficult. Um, and so slow down is the best thing that you can do. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so what are some projects of yours that we can look forward to? Well, one thing I'm actually considering doing um, is I've been really intrigued. I've heard this question posed a lot in the groups, the online stroke support groups. And I see it among women. Um, and I think, you know, women of childbearing age that are either pregnant or um, have delivered and want to nurse but are taking blood thinners are not really getting the answers they need from their doctors. I think that women's health around stroke and the childbearing years is gonna be very important. Um, we know that hormones um, and birth control pills are often the culprit of a stroke and um, women are at higher risk for those kinds of things. So I think that, that work needs to be done in that area for sure. Um, and then can you talk a little bit more about your workbook? I know you had you held it up a little bit earlier, but I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, um, so this workbook, The Caregiver's 12-Week Guide, I, I started this book because in the beginning part of stroke, you know, when I was first writing the book, I, these are the criticisms that I got. Who's it for? The caregiver, the survivor. And I kept saying, well, it's both. Like, it is a dance. Right In the beginning, the caregiver has more responsibility, but the stroke survivor, the thriver, the care partner, I should say, has more responsibility. But as the person improves, that dance kind of changes. But in the beginning, as a caregiver, there is a lot of information to take care of. And I can't tell you how many homes I've gone into where there are literally five different sheets of paper for different things you know, the blood pressure, and they're writing their own graphs. They've got a ruler and they're putting their blood pressure in one spot, but everything is done by hand. So I have one of my pages is, you know, the monthly blood pressure thing. Everything in here could be just either taken to a doctor's visit. Um, so for example, questions, I've got it under medical, physical, cognitive, speech, emotional behavior. How many times do we have questions, but in the busyness of our day, we forget and we don't write it down. Like all of a sudden I noticed my loved one did something. I, I like, I have a question about that. That was strange. I want to ask, is it a medication thing? Is it a physical therapy thing? If you write that question down and either snap a picture of it or bring the book to the appointment, you can get that addressed. The appointments go quickly. We get lost in the conversation. We forget to ask our questions. Um, there are pillars of health that I have here for the caregiver, and they're for everybody too. Drinking, right? That's not alcohol. <laughs> it's water, hydration. We talked about hydration, eating healthy food, getting sleep, exercise, self-care, and connecting. As a caregiver, you have to give to yourself first before you can give. 
And I know every care partner will say, well, yeah, that's nice, but that's not going to happen. And yet I've worked with care partners who have found a way to make sure that they do that. They become better care partners, but they also protect themselves. Because the truth is that care partners are at huge risk for physical injury themselves and for burning out. Um, so there's that kind of information. And believe it or not, care partners have the ability to dream and create breaks for themselves as well. So there are lots of activities in here. Very slowly, um, one of the things that I really like is, um, you know, hand or in, like that help is not a dirty word, asking for help, right? But also when family's not an option, who you can ask for help um, and telling the truth, you know, talking about the three hardest things about being a care partner or what. Um, finding help in that way. And then what would make caregiving easy? I love this page too, because when we talk about what we want, we usually say what we don't want. Well, I don't want a care partner. I don't want somebody to be in the house and I don't want them to do this. Okay, well, what, what do you want, right? So sometimes we have to put in the category of what we don't want to turn it into what we do want. Um, so it gives the care partner a means and an ability to really simplify their life and keep it more organized and easier. I'm all about ease. That's like, I wanna make everything easier and simpler. Thank you. So we're actually getting close to the end of today's session, but I would love to know what is one main takeaway that you would like to share with our audience today? I want you to do this. If you're able to stand and walk, I want you to do it. If you're to stand and walk, it's no problem. You can just look at the computer. If you're, I want you to walk. Now I want you to just the tiniest little bit. And if you're not walking, then just do it with your eyes, right? So look at the camera or just tiny pivot to the side. I want you to walk. And you see that tiny pivot. Over a period of time, it's going to take a different location. As you look at your daily life, one little tiny change moving towards the area of recovery, over time, is going to take you there. You've got to look for what's working and make that tiny change and commit to that tiny change every day. And then look for what worked there what you learned and what worked next. That's how you maintain your hope and fuel for your recovery. Sigourna, thank you so much for being here with us today and for encouraging us all to move forward with a positive attitude. And to our audience, thank you for being here with us. Those of you who are joining us on YouTube, we would sincerely appreciate if you would like, comment, and subscribe. For more information on aphasia and National Aphasia Association related events, please visit us at www.aphasia.org slash online dash events. We also encourage you to visit Sigourna's website. Sigourna has some incredible resources on her website, www.sigourna.com. And today she's sharing aphasia tips communication guide with our audience. For your copy, please email hopeafterstrokenow at gmail.com. That's hopeafterstrokenow at gmail.com. We would love to see you at the next Ask the Expert. On February 10th, we'll be having a conversation with Maya Henry about primary progressive aphasia. And on March 10th, we'll be having a conversation with Jenny Rook about music therapy and communication. We also have some fantastic aphasia-friendly online groups. On Thursdays, we have a book club and we'll be starting our next book on February 17th. Professionals with Aphasia Connect is a peer-led conversation group for persons with aphasia who have gone back to work or would like to go back to work. If you're interested in sharing your knowledge about aphasia, we'll be starting our Aphasia Ambassador Program soon. Thank you again so much for your support. We'll see you at the next one.